At long last, I'm hoping to get good audio. Don't look at the junk in my room. It's it's not clean yet. Uh, but look, I'm actually wearing my merch today. I, I completely did that on purpose. J just so you all know, I did that on purpose. I'm so good at merch selling. You know, this is almost the only shirt in my store that anybody ever buys, and I think it's because it's the only one I ever wear. First things first. That's not in preparation for the video so much, as it is in preparation for tonight I plan on deleting a bunch of old videos off my channel that no longer uh, represent me, and it's going to be a stroll down memory lane, and it's probably not going to be a stroll down memory lane that I enjoy. So, uh, clink. By the time I get to that, I want to be drunk. Yes, I could just take the Klonopin, but it's not enough. Anyway, hey guys, it's Sad Crow Man, and welcome to my storytelling channel. I am still in the middle of re-releasing my flop of a book, and I thought I'd keep you guys updated on my uh, writing process, for those of you who are interested in that sort of thing. And of course, I have gotten some requests for writing advice, so I figured why not. And I would like to use today to reflect on some bad writing advice I've gotten, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, I admit this video will go into some surface details of events that take place in the book, but there, I'll make sure that I made sure there are no major spoilers or anything like that in there. So while it may not make total perfect sense if you haven't read the book, I'll try to provide just enough context to where uh, the advice I'm giving and the journey I'm going on makes sense out of context without spoiling the plot of the book. And as always, if um, you want to comment something that has spoilers on it, please um, hit the enter line a couple times, you know, since for some reason YouTube's comments section is still not sophisticated enough to where we have a spoiler tag, you'd think that'd be something they'd give us by now as a spoiler tag. I mean, how hard would it be to give us a spoiler tag? Anyway, for those of you who don't know me and don't know my book, basically all you have to know about it, uh, it's told from the perspective of the captive, William, and it's about his captors, Eredi and Elijah, and their, the shenanigans they get into, and, uh, and Stockholm Syndrome sets in, blah blah blah. It's if you're really, really lonely and messed up in the head, it's kind of like a slice of life story, really. Oh, and the genre is comedy. I keep forgetting I should probably lead with that because otherwise people are gonna expect something totally different, you know, given the subject matter. So I released the book in November of 2019, or no, I think that was the intended release date. It ended up not coming out until December, and even for all my rushing, it, it just should have never come out because it came out too soon. My book was not ready. There was a big, huge, glaring error I had with it. There was something about it that was totally off. Like some kind of Jenga block that was missing, that was making the whole book fall apart, and I could not figure out what that was until finally, like what, seven years later, I'm finally getting it. <laughs> you see, while I was refining one of my beta drafts, I was actually in college to become a writer. Uh, technically, I was like double majoring, triple majoring, whatever. I was studying literature, I was studying creative writing, and I was studying psychology. I was a busy bird. Uh, it, actually, it's more like triple minoring. It, it's, it's really hard to explain my degree because my degree is stupid. I could make a video dedicated to my stupid degree. But anyway, my point is I had a writing professor who I really respected, and I really respected his advice. So from time to time, I asked him for advice on the book I was writing, since it was basically taking over my life, even back then in, what was it, 2016, 2017, something like that. Back when my YouTube channel was scarcely a thought. So he gave me two pieces of advice for my book that I really took to heart. One was that my book was just getting longer and longer and longer, and I needed to wrap it up. The other was that I should not write my book 
from multiple points of view, and I forget his reason for that, but... I think it was something about keeping the plot cohesive, but basically he said it was possible to pull off, but very difficult. So I'm guessing he didn't have a lot of faith in me as a writer. <laughs> oh well. But anyway, spoiler alert, both of these pieces of advice ended up hurting my book more than they helped it. Now, I'm sure he was trying to be helpful. I highly doubt my professor was trying to sabotage my book and make it flop. However, I think if he had read my book, that is not the advice he would have given me. My point with this is do not take any advice for your book that you receive as the law, especially not if it came from somebody who did not read your book, no matter how much you respect that person, no matter how often you agree with them in class. Just because they're a good writer, that doesn't mean they know what's good for your book, especially if they, again, have not read it. In retrospect, this seems so obvious, but if you had told me that back then, I'd been like, no, no, I trust my professor. He knows what he's talking about. I don't know what I've been talk what I'm talking about. I've only been writing for a couple years, and most of that time wasn't spent writing. It was spent watching Frozen over and over again. But no, no, no. I needed to listen to myself, to my own gut for once, to my own instinct, because deep down, I've known for a while. I just haven't been able to articulate it because I was so attached to this advice from my professor. Advice that would have served my short stories very well. Let's just be honest here, that, that advice would have been really great for one of my short stories, but for my novel, it just did not work. I mentioned my short stories, of course, because this, this was a creative writing class, so he's read my short stories. So basically, he was giving me advice for my novel based off of what he saw that was wrong with my short stories. Having multiple points of view did not work for my short story that had multiple points of view because my short story was short, so it just kind of made the narrative go all over the place and it just wasn't good. It, the plot was very... I mean, the plot trucked along just fine, but getting to know the characters just wasn't that satisfying. Meanwhile, um, yeah, a lot of my short stories just kept longer and longer instead of keeping them more concise, which is bad for a short story because, you know, they're supposed to be short, so you don't want to amble on and on about something irrelevant during your short story. So yeah, it wasn't intrinsically bad advice that he gave me. It was just bad advice for Cry for the Devil. Now, of course, I always recommend considering everybody's advice, at least, even if it's bad advice. Like, you should listen to all the advice you get, because even the bad advice you receive that may help you articulate, A, why is that advice bad, why is that not helpful for my book, and B, you may be able to rework it into good advice. Constructive criticism is very important, and I know I didn't skip the beta reader uh, part on purpose. I skipped it because all my beta readers, like, forgot about me or were snubbing me on purpose. Damn those beta readers. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, funnily enough, I even found some of the more scathing criticisms from my book reviews to be more helpful for my book than the advice that my professor gave me because, uh, yeah, my professor, he was coming from a place of trying to help, a place of knowledge, a place of knowing what to do, but he hadn't read my book. Yeah, a lot of the negative criticism my book got when it came out and flopped, uh, they may not have been exactly right, like objectively correct, but that's just because they didn't know what I was going for, which taught me that I had not adequately communicated what I was going for as a writer. And yeah, yeah, I know, not every writer is going to get everything, but, but when your book has mixed reviews and a low general average rating, hello, butter nugget, uh, you might want to consider some of the criticism. Hello, Buttsby. Do you want to be in my video, Buttsby? Of course you do, Buttsby. You want to be in the video. Look how fluffy he is. He's got his winter coat, guys. He's got his winter coat. Look at how fluffy. 
turn to the camera and let them see. Look at this big fluffy mane. He's so full of fluff. He's bigger than me and he's full of fluff. Give me my script back. Just because I don't follow my script doesn't mean you can take it from me, Buttsby. And you know, that's not just true for book reviewers. It's also true for your beta readers. If you disagree with somebody, consider why you disagree with them and reconcile that with what you're trying to accomplish with your book so that way you can be damn sure you've accomplished it. Now, of course, this advice may not be great if you write for, like, a hobby or for fun or to make yourself happy, but... I mean, I write for all those reasons, too, but I'm also, like, a toxic perfectionist, so... <laughs> I want everyone to understand the story I'm telling, even though that's like an impossible goal and it's a goal I need to let go of. I admit that. I admit that. So anyway, going back to my professor's advice, this is what I've realized about it. So first of all, we'll talk about the multiple points of view thing. I've already discussed this a bit in a previous video, but my solution that I went with was I took the character who is kind of in the action but not directly involved in the action, aka the kidnapping victim, and I chose to tell the story through his eyes. And for the most part, this was a really good decision. But you know what an even better solution would have been? To just use multiple perspectives. I mean, I already did kind of break that rule because you'll notice throughout the book there are a couple of chapters that are written from an omniscient point of view. Uh, I think there might even be one written from Elijah's point of view or no, no, that was another omniscient one but it just followed his thoughts. Well, that, that one's going to be deleted anyway because I hated it. More on that later, but... <laughs> the thing is, readers they really enjoyed those chapters that stepped out of William's point of view and followed Eredi and Elijah. And you know what the reason was where I was afraid to put those chapters in to begin with? It wasn't because I didn't think they were good or because I didn't think they were entertaining enough. It's because I was like, oh, I'm breaking the rules. I'm breaking the writing rules. You know, me and all of my... How old was I when I was writing this? Like 25? Stupid. There are no writing rules that are not meant to be broken. If a writing rule is making your writing worse, do not follow it. But you know what I think it is that made that point of view shift so great and so necessary was because the story, it wasn't about William. Not really. I mean, he is a main character in his own right. Uh, he didn't have as much agency as most main characters would. But, you know, that's because he was the narrator. He was the narrator of Eredi and Williams, I'm sorry, Eredi and Williams, Eredi and Elijah's story. So more intimate chapters where we really got to get into Eredi and Elijah's heads, those were important because it was their story. Granted, I couldn't write the whole story from their point of view because they're these cloud cuckoo landers who have no idea what the real world is like. They're each a little bit loopy, you know. <laughs> they do not have an accurate view of the world or the way it works. You know, Eredi's this heiress of a conglomerate company. She's, like, stupid by choice, pretty much. <laughs> She's never been challenged in her whole life, and her parents were interesting people. Meanwhile, Elijah, he's, um, you know, he's got, like, six, seven comorbid mental illnesses. I forgot the exact number. And, you know, throughout, like, the first half of the book. So, you know, they're not the best choice for narrators through most of the book. But that doesn't mean that I should have it to where they are completely absent from it because it's their story. So I'm thinking what it should have been all along was not William's story about Eredi and Elijah with a couple omniscient chapters sprinkled in. It should have been... William, Eredi, and Elijah's story, all three equally. So that's what I'm aiming for in the re-release. Though Elijah will still be the primary antagonist throughout most of the book. Now for the advice 
that my book was just getting longer and longer and longer and longer and I just needed to end it. That would have been good advice if it was just that I was scared to say goodbye to my book, which that, that, that was part of it. I didn't want to say goodbye to my book because I was having a lot of fun writing it and that's why the story kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. However, there was still a lot of really interesting stories to be told and some of those stories were you know, really important because we have already she's a main character and she really got f***ed over, man. There's a lot that needs to be told about already that just never gets told. So this advice, it was also uh, very bad advice for Cry for the Devil. Because you see, my book is long for the same reason that like, a Song of Ice and Fire is long. It's because the scope of my stories is big. He said it was a crutch that my stories kept getting longer and longer, but I couldn't agree less. And that That's a really weird word to use anyway, and I don't know what he meant by it. But I, I assumed that it may, not making any sense was just it meant he had some wisdom superior to mine. I really did not trust myself at all. Like, I know this sounds like he was trying to sabotage me. I swear, I promise, I do not think he was trying to sabotage me. I think it, most people would have listened to that advice and thought, yeah, that doesn't apply to my book, I'm not gonna use it. <laughs> oh, boy. You see, the thing is, I have known how my book was going to end since 2015. It wasn't the exact first draft I wrote for my ending, but... The ending of my book, which hasn't been read yet, uh, you know, because I cut it off cliffhanger-wise, I wrote that right after writing the first chapter. I wrote the first chapter and then I wrote the last chapter. And the reason I did it like that was because I wanted to know where I was going. So I spent the whole time I was writing that book putting in what needed to be put in in order to reach that finish line, in order to reach that ending in a way that was very satisfying to audiences, that made sense to audiences, and would not have given me, like, hate mail every day. And at that time, he wanted me to end my book that he hadn't read. There just wasn't enough story to get me from that point A to point B in a way that was satisfying. So in my case, with Cry for the Devil, the solution was not to make the story shorter, but longer. It needed to take some more time to smell the roses, to explore character plots that hadn't been explored yet. Because, like, no ending is satisfied if you don't have enough reason to get to that ending. Oh, two minutes left on the clock. Hold on. Sorry, butts, but you need to go down now. He's like, but I want the lap, but I want the lap. But we only have two minutes left. I have to hit. First of all, credit where credit's due. I was browsing my recommended a little bit ago, you know, the recommended page on YouTube, and I ran across this channel called Shaylin Writes. And I don't remember if this, the video I'm talking about is the one I shared with you guys, but I did share one of her videos on my community panel. At least I, I think her pronouns are her. I'm sorry if I got pronouns wrong, but anyway, um, I usually hate writing advice videos, but I just got a really good vibe off of that one, so I clicked it, I watched it, and I loved it. Her channel is really helpful because she doesn't just tell you what to do. She explains why you do it, but then she'll also counter that with times when you may not want to do that. She's very, very thorough, very articulate. It's just, it's a wonderful channel, and if you're a writer, I really recommend check. I'm going to try to link that below. If I didn't link this below in the description or a top comment or something, somebody remind me to link it, so I link it. Anyway, just something she said in one of her videos is that sometimes if your story feels dull or uninteresting, the answer is not to speed it up and gloss over all that boring ah! shit, but to slow it down and take your time with it. And that's when it all clicked for me. That's when I really started to understand what I was doing wrong. Why am I doing this with my hand? I'm like, okay, anyway. <laughs> I forgot what I was saying. Anyway, that is when it hit me. The fatal flaw of my book is, drumroll, 
You won't suspect it, I haven't mentioned it yet. The starting point. The problem is the starting point. The day in the timeline where I chose to start chapter one. The date is February 24th, 2015. You're with William at the gas station. He's bored. He's people watching the customers. He wants to go home. He meets a cute girl. She's drunk. He worries about her a little bit. He follows her into an alleyway. And then... Icicle murder! Hey, I think I knew you from somewhere! Kidnapping! Stuck in a sleaze motel! Waffle House! Waffle, Waffle House. House! Waffle, Waffle House. House! And it's just so much so fast that you don't have any time to get close to the characters, really. And finally, once you get to like page 40-something at that Waffle House, you start to connect with the characters and learn a little bit more about them. But the problem with that is, before you get there, like, you don't give a shit about William. Uh, unless you have a lot in common with William, uh, on those you get, like, what, a couple pages to really bond with him before his traumatic event. I mean... There's just not enough there. And I don't know about you guys, but I have a hard time caring about the fate of a character if I haven't bonded with them. And I know a lot of people didn't bond with Vil Villium. Villium? What, what's a Villium? I can't talk didn't bond with him, and I think more people would have bonded with him if I had put more of what was in, you know, that backstory video I made of him, if instead of implying that throughout the book, if I had given that stuff up more readily. I mean, that video has more views than the book has readers. I think by not putting that stuff directly in the book, I really shot myself in the foot. Now, of course, it's not totally awful all the time to start your story where the action starts. Sometimes that can be really great. But it's not like that is the only point of action I could have started the story with. You gotta start your story with the right point of action, and I can think of a much better point of action, and that is the day Simone goes missing. Simone, of course, being one of the main characters, Eretti's mother. And then if this kidnapping thing comes later, it's going to be a lot more tense because you've got more time to get to know William. So then what happens is you say you know William very well and you're attached to him and you know already very well at this point and you're attached to her. But then she kidnaps William to protect this character you barely even know who's a little bit sus to be honest and that's Elijah. That's a much more tense situation. And also another problem with starting your story with the action starts, and there's just simply no remedy for this as far as I know, and that's any action that happens before your chosen starting point. So if there's anything in your story's timeline that happens before you start the story, in other words, you are going to have to reveal that somehow if it's relevant to your plot. And you're gonna, your only options are going to be either mentioning it in the are going to be either mentioning it in dialogue or putting it in a flashback. And let's just be honest here. What do either of those things have tension to them? No. A flashback isn't going to be tense because you already know the characters made it out okay or you already know that characters made it out traumatized. If I'm the writer, it's more likely to be that one. But <laughs> you know what I mean, right? It's kind of annoying to juggle as a writer and it's not very engaging for the reader. I actually feel like the show Lost did it pretty well and Once Upon a Time, but uh, usually, usually I find flashbacks boring. And you see, what I did in my flop is I started the story a good 23 years later in the timeline from where the story starts because the story starts with Eredi's mother Simone. Now, of course, I, I'm taking care of that. There's going to be a whole Simone prequel and it's going to cover up her entire life from when she first starts university in, I believe, 1992 uh, all the way to her death in 2014. But then this flop book, when does it start? 
10 months after Simone dies. And in my story, that's a big problem because that leaves a 10 month gap where you don't know what happens unless it's told through flashback or dialogue. And that's a big problem because Eredi is one of the titular characters of this book. But instead of the story beginning where her mother goes missing and she doesn't know what to do and there's so much stuff going on, such a dramatic 10 months for her, it starts when she meets the narrator. But here's the thing, those 10 months, they weren't just dramatic for her. A lot of those 10 months, what happens in those 10 months are crucial to her development. They're crucial to being able to understand the ending. They're, it's crucial that we know what happens in those 10 months or else the ending, the way it ends for her, it seems to come out of nowhere. It just doesn't make any sense because we don't know Eredi well enough. To put this into perspective, Cry for the Devil was like 500 pages long or some sh** like that. Depending on how big you make the font. And it covers the span of what, like, three months? Except no, it doesn't actually cover the span of three months. It covers the span of a year because of all the flashbacking we have to do. <laughs> and of course some of that flashbacking is to Elijah's past. Quite a lot of it is. Uh, but, you know, already she was just very neglected. Actually, now that I think of it, it's more like I barely managed to cover any point of those 10 months. Just a, a couple of scant scenes here and there are either alluded to or mentioned in book one. And those 10, without those 10 months, you don't understand it already. And if you don't understand it already, you don't understand why she did what she did in the ending. And if you don't understand why she did what she did for the ending, then the ending doesn't make any sense. And if you don't understand the ending, the whole book is a flop, in my opinion. Like, the whole book is shit. To me, the ending completely makes or breaks the story. And that's why I cut it off. So, translating this into advice for you guys, don't marry your first chapter. Was my first chapter pretty good? A apparently it was. My sister really liked it at least and she uh, bugged me over and over and over again to finish the rest of the book because she liked that first chapter so it can't have been that bad but <laughs> we don't have that kind of relationship by the way where we um, act like we love things we don't. We have that blunt mean sibling type of relationship. <laughs> I was so, like, committed to the story's starting point that I was deluded into believing that it had to start with William walking in on that murder and getting kidnapped. Just because the story was told through his eyes. And for the most part, for the book, that was the right call to make, you know. But the character who opened the story should have definitely been Eredi because she is the one that the plot is focusing around at that point. The only reason the plot is focusing on William at that point, the only reason it seems like it's focusing on him, is because he's the one telling the story. But all of the drama, all of the events of the book, they're all surrounding around Eredi. So she would have been the ideal protagonist for the start of the book. And when did her story start? Did it start when she was attacked in that alleyway? No. It started ten months beforehand when her mother went missing. And now I know what you may be thinking, okay, but that doesn't that leave like 10 months until we get to meet William? Not necessarily. I mean, like I said, I plan on moving the furniture around so I can have Eredi meet William at any time, especially since, you know, the reason the plot unfolds the way it did is because she recognizes him from somewhere. And, you know, it's kind of odd, I think, that I put it into where she recognized him from somewhere, which, uh, not really a spoiler because this is chapter one. She recognized him from a book jacket cover, but she's like the heiress of a conglomerate company, so shouldn't he have had the same feeling of, hey, I think I know her from somewhere? Because, I mean, if you ran into, say, Paris Hilton, wouldn't you think, oh, hey, don't I know her from somewhere? I, I don't know. Just, uh, I'll have to fix that. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I can go ahead. I can move around the time they meet each other if it serves the story better. And if it doesn't serve the story better, I can just 
I can still find some way to tie him in so that way the reader, any reader who's going into this blind and doesn't know where it starts out, doesn't pick this up, book up and be like, who is this depressed weirdo and why should I care that he got a job at a gas station? I just want to read more about my goth girlfriend. Where is she? Now you may remember, I think in my last video uh, where I talked about my writing and my update on that, uh, I said I was trying to remedy Eretti's neglect by putting a prologue in her perspective, but that ended up not working out for me because while the book, it made the book a hundred times better, but there was just too much stuff to, for me to stuff inside of that one prologue. And you know, I still also needed a place for all of William's backstory. So why start the book with the icicle stabbing and the kidnapping and all that? So again, best starting point, the day Eretti's mother goes missing. Now funnily enough, those 10 months were originally going to be the subject of a prequel told from the perspectives alternating of Eretti and Elijah. But once I decided to make the re-release its own contained story, having Elijah's perspective actually would have made that worse and not better. Now, I was... Now, of course, I was originally planning on scrapping this prequel altogether, but that had some effects. Uh, for one thing, there's a whole ass character, and that's Eredi's first boyfriend. He doesn't have a name yet, I admit. Still, after all these years, I haven't thought of a good name for him. But, yeah, Eredi's first boyfriend during those ten months, uh, he's pretty much reduced to a line of dialogue that is just kind of between Eredi and Elijah toward the end, and barely any attention is paid attention to it, and... He's actually a really important character, and her interactions with him end up impacting a lot of the decisions she makes in uh, Cry for the Devil. Shaylin's advice to slow a story down to make a story more interesting instead of speeding it up, which is what I was trying to do with that prologue, it fits this re-release perfectly. And anything that doesn't fix, putting it in Eretti's point of view does fix, partially in Eretti's point of view anyway, not entirely in her point of view. For example, I always felt the subplot with the stuffed rabbit Hoppy was super melodramatic, but I couldn't really articulate why. Uh, for those who didn't read the book, uh, it's not that big of a plot point really. They're all sleeping in the same room, Eretti wakes William up crying to Elijah about some stuffed rabbit that she had when she was a kid. Uh, and this is like the inciting incident in like a chain of melodramatic event after melodramatic event. Man, this is a killer bruise. I didn't even notice this. How did I get this bruise? Oh well. Now, personally, I don't find this to be an ostentatious problem with the book because, again, William's the narrator. William has just had a rude awakening. Of course he's going to think it's melodramatic. He's annoyed. He's angry. So therefore, to me, the melodrama gets lampshaded naturally by the plot. But that's not really how I wanted it to come across, is the thing. It came across in a good way. It came across in an entertaining way, but it didn't come out the way I wanted it to, because I wanted for the reader to be able to empathize with all three characters in this situation. And all three characters each have their own view and perspective and stakes in this silly little pl subplot, excuse me. But you're only getting William's side. So if you're only getting William's side and he's super annoyed and he just wants her to shut up and he thinks that they're being drama queens about it, you're not getting Eretti's side, why she's so tender about it, or Elijah's side, why he's so invested in it. So it just, it doesn't work. It, I mean, it works from um, a one-time gag, but it doesn't work for a true subplot, in my personal opinion. If you liked the hoppy thing as it was, then you're, you're allowed to, but I didn't like it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Basically, the way I see it, I don't need for the reader to like Eretti or to like Elijah, but I do need to give them the opportunity to fully understand them. That's very, very important to me, and that's one of my goals as a writer. And, you know, I feel like the whole book is like that, actually. Not just the 
subplot with the stuffed animal, but the whole book, just in general. There are a lot of points in the book where it's easier to empathize with William than it is Elijah and Eredi. Like, there are points, I'd say, where it's actually just physically difficult to empathize with Elijah and Eredi. I mean, pretty much all they've got going for them as characters is that they're thirst traps. And a lot of this is because there's just not enough time dedicated to Eredi's side of the story because, like, it, not just before the Stockholm Syndrome sets in, but, like, ever, because even after the Stockholm Syndrome really starts to set in, William just doesn't bond with Eredi the same way he bonds with Elisha. Thus, the obvious solution is that the re-release needs Eredi's point of view. The lint roller was never in the shot and you never saw it. This is an extremely aesthetic production. Anyway, besides, I would have to be stupid as all hell to undersell Eredi's backstory. She's like the most popular character. And you know, Simone and Elijah, they both have their backstories told, their whole stories pretty much more or less told in the prequel series that's set between 1992 and 2014. That covers most of their lives. And then even William, William is slated to have his, you know, I'm not sure I want to make it a direct sequel. I'll probably have it set in 2020, but I feel like even after the plot of Cry for the Devil, after Eredi and Elijah, you know, go through their character arcs, there's still room for William, so he's gonna get his whole novel that's all for him, probably. But then where does that leave Eredi? What does she get? It's not fair if she doesn't get her own book, or at least part of her own book, right? And I don't... And the thing is, there's no reason to neglect her anyway, because she's actually a really interesting character, and a lot of the things that are most interesting about her just didn't make it in the story. I mean, come on, think about it. She has this helicopter mom who makes all of her decisions for her, helps her do everything, even things that her, at her age, she should be doing. And then all of a sudden, this helicopter mom goes missing. She doesn't pick Eredi up. Where is she? Like, imagine the panic and horror, and especially when she realizes that she's never going to be able to get advice from her mother again. That's, I mean, the whole CEO of her life has gone missing. What does she do now? And I think that's a really interesting way to start out a novel. And I'll be I've never read a book like that before. I'm not saying that this has never before been done, but kidnapping, that's probably been done. This dependent personality disorder, I haven't really seen dependent personality disorder played out like this before. It could make for a pretty interesting story. But you know what I did instead of having those 10 months written out? I have one chapter set an entire year later where Eredi whines about how much she misses her mom. That's what I gave the readers. That's what I gave you guys. Instead of you actually getting to see the rug getting pulled out from under her, that's what you see. Like, I am cheating you all if I don't let you see Eredi's grief and terror. And you know what? That's one thing I liked about the prequel that I canceled. You get to see her character arc of finding independence from start to finish. Because what we have right now in Cry for the Devil, we have a piece of it. She's a little bit more mature than she was a year before the story started. And I just think it would be way more entertaining if you got to see her entire journey. And also by pushing back the story's start date to March 2014, you get that chance to see how vulnerable William is before the kidnapping. Because I think that's something a lot of readers had a problem with was they just couldn't believe anyone would act the way William acted. I, of course, had explanations for why William acted the way he acted, but most readers aren't psychiatrists. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist either, but you know what I mean. Most readers aren't psychoanalyzing every character and thinking, huh, I wonder if this is what led him to 
so easily become entranced by his captors. No, they're thinking, wow, what a rubbish book. This shitty writer doesn't understand people at all. And they just toss that book into the wood chipper. And of course, I've had a lot of, uh, technically I have bipolar disorder, but, you know, along with that, I've had a lot of periods of depression in my life, so it's not even like this will be hard for me to write. You know, I've had those periods of depression and loneliness, and I think I know how I can write this and make it interesting. Did I ever tell you guys about my telenovela phase? Damn, Ruby got karma hard. Hard, okay? <laughs> Show of hands, who's shocked that I was once so lonely I had a telenovela face? <laughs> Actually, now that I think of it, some parts of this book kind of read like a telenovela, don't they? <laughs> Oh, well, okay, moving on, moving on. I've been talking for quite a while now. So, t before I close out this video, I want to, for those of you who are following the development of this re-release, what does all of this mean for the re-release? Well, first of all, it will now be divided into three parts instead of one big long run. Part one will focus mainly on, you guessed it, Eredi and it will contain scenes that were meant for the originally cancelled prequel, which by the way means some of these scenes are already drafted out or even written out. So it's not too much extra work on my part. And I'm really glad, you know, us writers, we have to kill our darlings so many times to be able to resurrect one. It feels like I'm cheating or something. <laughs> Now part two, that will start where the original flop release started. So, you know, with the kidnapping and all that. Much like with the flop release, part two will mainly be in William's perspective, possibly almost entirely depending on which narrator is best for what part. Though there will, of course, be a couple of scenes in Eredi's perspective as well. Part three will begin after the resolution of that um, cactus subplot and it will finally introduce Elijah as a narrator. Like I said, it starts after the cactus subplot resolves, and it'll go on until each character's character arcs are completely resolved. I do not like books that leave unnecessary tangly bits that don't get addressed, if you know what I mean. You know, those dropped plots. So any plot that doesn't get resolved in Cry for the Devil, any character arc that's left un incomplete in Cry for the Devil, I assure you that's only because it's planned for a prequel or a sequel. I say a prequel like there's any chance of me writing more than one. I'm having a hard enough time with the one. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty good wine, actually. Probably shouldn't have poured myself such a big mason jar of that. I don't think I'm going to finish it. <laughs> So you may be wondering, okay, so basically you're saying parts two and three are just the rest of the book as they are, but improved, and the cliffhanger will be removed and filled in? And not exactly. Uh, you know, certain reveals, because of the different characters and point of view shifts and whatnot, certain reveals will come at certain points. They'll come at better points that are more logical, in my opinion. I promise every change I make will simply be to make the book run more smoothly, basically. You know, I'm, I'm autistic, I'm change resistant, I promise I'm not going to make any random changes that do not need to be made. Every choice I make will be made to make the story better. I'm a much more experienced writer now than when I started out. When I started out, I had been writing for like maybe a year or two, and I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but now I know what I'm doing. So yeah, for those of you who love Cry for the Devil for what it is, I promise you I am not making any unnecessary changes. It's like if for years your living room like had this couch pushed up against the door and the TV was faced against the wall and then one day you came home to like all the same furniture but it was finally placed in a layout that made sense. Also you may have noticed a theme here. Part one is Eredi, part two is William, and part three is Elijah. So what will that mean? 
So what will be in there, part one, will mostly be told in Eretti's perspective, though there will be a couple of William scenes in it. Part two will mostly be William, but there will be a lot more Eretti scenes in there as well. And part three will still mainly be probably William talking, but uh, there will be some scenes with Elijah finally. And you will finally be able to hear his side of the story from his mouth. I feel like this setup allows us to actually earn Elijah's point of view. So it's like actually rewarding when he finally comes up to talk instead of it feeling melodramatic like it did in the, you know, story where he was uh, reflecting on his days as a Marine. I've always hated that chapter and the only reason that chapter made it to print was because I couldn't think of anything better at the time. <laughs> Which, uh, pro tip, if you're self-publishing, do not release your book until you are happy with it or else you will be forever unhappy for the rest of your days. If you're anything like me anyway. I mean, technically the events of that chapter still have to occur but they won't be in Elijah's perspective anymore. They'll be in Eretti's perspective. Although that does mean there's one very short, sweet cha exchange of dialogue that I'm gonna really miss, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Now, I mean, I was afraid um, to let Elijah narrate more than that in like the OG release because I didn't want to kill the reader's fun at untangling that mess of a man, if you know what I mean. But at some point, the reader needs answers, you know? Why is he so obsessed with her ready? Why did he do what he did at the end? Why did he do all this convoluted shit to begin with? And I tried to answer all those questions and I did answer all those questions, but I answered them through subtext, and subtext is really hard to pick up, especially since I didn't actually end up providing enough subtext. <sighs> so really, I needed to stop being so stingy with the answers. And who is the best narrator to give answers about Elijah? That's right. A licensed psychotherapist. But unfortunately there isn't one of those in the story, so we'll have to settle with Elisha. Of course there are things that I'll miss about starting with William and keeping the book in his perspective, but just because I'm attached to the reveals as they unfold, that doesn't necessarily mean that they came at the right time or that all those reveals were necessary at those times or that the book I'm attached to is actually better. And I think that can be something that's hard for writers. Like, is this actually good or am I just emotionally attached to it? And you know, most of the tension early on, it comes from Elijah, not Eretti. So th there's really no reason to wait for, you know, William to run into Eretti for the story to begin. And it was fun to get to know Eretti from William's perspective, but again, he's not as receptive to her as he is to Elisha. So while it starts out fun and interesting, the longer the book goes on, the more you it just stops working. And there just weren't enough opportunities to really delve into Eretti's backstory, unless I wanted to burden the uh, pacing with more and more flashbacks, more cumbersome dialogue, talking about things that happened long ago. I just, it just wasn't working. I hate that it wasn't working because I'm attached to it, but it wasn't working. The story, it's just, it's going to be so much more complete and run more smoothly with Eretti starting out the narration. Because when you get both William's full point of view and Eretti's full point of view, the only character I have to worry about unraveling throughout it is our antagonist, Elijah. And at first I was worried that it would remove like all the mystery to Eretti's character, but really just because she's the narrator, that doesn't mean that I have to have her like lay out all of her cards on the table at once. She can still keep secrets from the um, reader. She doesn't have to spill the, all the beans immediately. I, I'm really bad at metaphors and yet I insist on using them. I don't know why I'm like this, but I hope I'm making sense. But now that I've figured out 
what wasn't working about my book, I feel so much more optimistic about the re-release now, especially now that I am medicated finally. It's not all kicked in yet. It's going to take quite a long time for this medication to build in my system, but I am I'm very relieved. Everything just seems to be falling into place for once, and it's been a long time with a lot of dread, but I finally feel like things are finally going to start to work out. It's been a long, long road. A long, how long has it been? Started the first draft in 2014. A long eight years. <laughs> this has been quite a long video. I hope it helped some of you guys with your own writing, and I hope it helped reassure people who are awaiting Cry for the Devil that the re-release is going to be much better than the original. I'm very confident in that. Now I just need a new title for it because Cry for the Devil, I never liked that title. It's always been too f***ing basic. And plus, there's a story now called... It's basically Cry for the Devil, but reworded. And it's bigger than mine already, so I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> Probably a coincidence. So I'm like, ugh. I have some ideas, but my idea already has a music album with the same title, so I'm going to find- I'm gonna- I'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board with the title, but... Anyway, that's all for now. Uh, please rate, subscribe, and blessed be, motherfuckers. See y'all. Like all of us, William's story starts with his parents. A Mexican woman named Sofia Quinones Garcia and her boyfriend, an American man of Nordic and English descent, named Arthur Brown. It was the early 80s. The two of them met while she was studying at the Universidad de Guadalajara, and he was visiting on a work visa. She was only 18 years old, too young to be having children in my opinion, but sometimes nature does happen. Uh, their daughter, Sherry Maria, was described as a happy accident or a miracle. However, since Sherry was born out of wedlock, Sophia's highly conservative Catholic family nearly disowned her. If it weren't for her mother vouching for Sophia, they would not have let her come home. The tension was high, so the couple made plans to move to America after she completed university. However, Sophia did not feel that they should necessarily get married just because they had a child together. 